Good morning, Infinity. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the space of gratitude, of amplification, and a powerful spiritual ritual known as the Infinity Fellowship. Wherever you're tuning in from, wherever you are uh, tuning in from, in terms of a space that's within your heart, within your heart space, we welcome you. My name is Jeff Obafemi Carr. I'm the Chief Spiritual Officer here at Infinity. And however you found your uh, way to the space today, whether it is live, whether it is on the replay, we welcome you into our Sunday ritual, our gathering, our Sunday fellowship, our interspiritual community. It's great to have you here. Congratulations for taking the time out to invest a, a few moments in your spirituality on a regular basis with us here at infinity this is the third sunday in the month every third sunday is if speaks so we have a powerful conversation coming up for the message today i hope you got your notepad ready you got your journal ready uh, and we have our spirits and our hearts open uh, let us begin by acknowledging the sacred space by acknowledging the creator who is known by many names the ancestors upon whose shoulders we stand, and by generating gratitude. So as I welcome you into this space, as you tag your friends, as you hit the subscribe button, if you're there on YouTube, if you hit the like button, if you're here on Facebook, or wherever you might be, we thank you on behalf of Spirit for taking the time out today uh, to invest a few moments with the Infinity Fellowship to live, to learn, to love, to grow, to empower the gift that is inside you, that gift of being the light of all that is, was, and ever shall be. So take a deep breath with me. Exhale to release that. Another deep and powerful cleansing breath in. Exhale to release. Another deep breath in, inhaling the good. Pause that at the top, feel that energy there. And exhale to release all the things that do not serve you. We welcome you into the beginning of our sacred service today. And we pause to begin in opening prayer by pouring energy into realignment toward manifestation. Find the space of stillness with us now. Allow all eyes to close, all heads to bow, and all hearts to open. wise, all-knowing God, our divine creator, our mother, our father, our divine and common source, we welcome you in acknowledgement in this moment at the place that we all call the core of consciousness and the apex of authenticity. It is an authentic space that we tap in when we evoke you today. We speak your energies, we speak your names and that, are, that are written in our hearts. We speak the images that are written on the inside of our eyelids for you, recognizing that although you may be perceived by many different names, by many different manifestations over the history of our people, of all humanity, we know that regardless of perception, there is a knowledge of you that goes beyond just faith. It goes beyond just belief. But it is a powerful knowing, a knowing that you are always with us in a present sense. And it is from that place of knowing that we say thank you today because you are known by one united energy for all of the various people who are gathering in this space today from all over the world. We speak gratitude 
for those who paused in this moment with us in this powerful vibration of acknowledgement thank you for those who are dealing with the storms with the snow with the ice thank you for getting us here this morning we know that it was an uphill trek up nocturne drive and it was a slick and somewhat dangerous journey but we dug out yesterday in nashville tennessee and we came up that hill today and i just want to say thank you for the gift of getting us here safely thanks for delivering sister alicia here to work the controls today through the neighborhoods and the snow and the ice. Thank you for getting us and our neighbors who pushed our car out of the driveway so that we could be here today. Thank you for those who are still snowed in. Thank you for those in Texas right now who have rolling power. Thank you for those who are in Texas right now who are off the national grid, who are now having to deal with politics affecting their lives. We want to make sure that they are covered right now and that their energies as they are watching this from their cars and from their homes and on their tablets and their phones, that they know that we are sending them the divine affirmation energy that leads them through a difficult time. Thank you for those who are on the sunny beaches on either side of the country who are tuning in from that space. Make it be a space of gratitude today to see the sun shining. For those who are on the other side of the world, who are going into the evening time right now, who pause on Sunday night, this is a Sunday night service for them. We say thank you for the evening time and the stillness of the night in those places where we meditate on how good you've been to us. Thank you for the gift of healing. Thank you for the gift of strength. Thank you for the gift of ideas that are coming forth and people who are walking in their divine purpose. Thank you for the ability to love, the gift of empowerment. Thank you for this vibration today. We give thanks and we proclaim that we can do all things through you. That we stand on mighty shoulders. And that we are living every single day of this life, every single moment of this life, every single second of this life in gratitude and empowerment and in strength and in confidence. Because we know that we come from you. And if you be with us, who can be against us? Thank you for this divine gathering today. May something be said, shared, spoken, sung, high-fived, snapped into the world that reminds us that we are ever and always connected to you and connected through you. For these things and other things we cannot put into words, we simply say we thank you in gratitude. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Hotep. Shalom. Namaste. Ashe. Deep breath in. Exhale to release it. As we come back into this space for the pouring of libations, uh, we greet you in the names of the known and unknown ancestors upon whose shoulders we stand. We recognize that we are made in the image and likeness of all creation. All the stuff that is inside stars is inside of all of us. And everything is connected in a beautiful way. So we pause to open our services by pouring our libations. We pour out water because it represents the living. We pour it into the earth because the earth represents what happens to this earth suit when you get through wearing it. And guess what? When you get through wearing it, you go to the next level of consciousness and spirit. Because absence in this physical shell simply means presence in all divine creation. That's why you got the power that you got. I'm uh, shouting out Brother Courtney Hale's uh, Instagram feed. He pointed out that you're still surviving off your, of some, some of your grandmama's prayers. Right? And grandmama may be gone on a long time ago. But there are some things that she put in the universe that are still reverberating from you for you. There's some things that your great grandparents did that are going to reverberate for in the native tradition here and the indigenous people's tradition here for seven generations going forward. So when we pause in this moment to pour this powerful libation, we're connecting those dots, y'all, and we're painting the picture. So we pour this libation today at our altar that is representing the fire, the water, the air, and the earth, and the stairway to heaven based on a foundation. Isn't it great to stand tall when you're standing on some shoulders and you got some hands up under your feet and 
You're standing on backs that go back 50,000 years and you can't even count how many people are there. That's what's holding us up today. That's what's lifting us up today. We pause for a special libation. Uh, this is the 21st anniversary of the transition of Brother El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, also known as Brother Malcolm X. Uh, so we pause to recognize the contributions that you have put in this world, Brother Malcolm, and we talk to you in a present sense. The reason is when you were walking on this earth, brother, the people were not down for you. They were not walking around wearing X hats and T-shirts. People were saying you were nuts. People were saying you were crazy. People were saying, I can't get down with that brother. And regardless of what we see in the news real footage, we see a few hundred people gathering when there were millions of people in this country who thought you were an enemy. You are alive now more than you were when you were walking on this physical earth. And that's proof that there's something to this thing called legacy. Ashe. We pour it to the energy of Brother Reverend Fred Price, uh, who was an evangelical leader who built uh, a massive following globally and, and left a mark on the world. Theologically, you may or may not have agreed with many of his stances. That depends on you. I don't judge that. What I do say is there's something to be said about people who will put their heads down, stick their chests out, and build institutions because institutions change the world because they bring people together. Brother Fred Price, Ashe. Uh, to one of our uh, neighbors in the neighborhood who transitioned a while back, but whose name was invoked yesterday uh, as a wonderful radio personality in town, a Hollywood star, had a chance to see her uh, recently on a couple of episodes of Criminal Minds. I said, ah, I remember that brilliant smile, that, that strong, loving energy, and that wonderful voice. J. Karen Thomas, for those of you who remember, Ashe. And we ask now that as we go to the altar that you type in the names in the chat window. You know how we do it, Infinity. Of those people who you want to remember in this moment, as we pour this libation, you call their names aloud or type them in the chat window. And we know that as they are recognized, as they say, remember me, that energy is lifting you up. It is like the song says, you are the wind beneath my wings. So it is. Ashe? In the name of the energies of the north, of the south, of the east, and the west, Ashe. In the areas of the up and the down, Ashe. In the energies of the heart center, Ashe. In the names of those who we remember today in this moment as we open this divine space, we recognize the gifts that you had in this world, uh, some that you put in the world that people did not recognize while you were here. But we, looking back, were able to say that hindsight is 2020, and we give that gratitude for you, Ashe. To our ancestral mothers and ancestral fathers, Ashe. To those who are relatives, those who are related to us by blood, those who are related because they walk through the mud, Ashe. To those children in the world, in the womb, and yet unborn, Ashe. And to those who we remember today, the Frasers, Horace Marion and Elise Frazier, Tia Hale, those who are part of this community on this side of Northeast Nashville, who uh, at a time when segregation prevented them from living other places, they created a land of their own and a space of their own and said, in this space, we will be kings and queens. We feel that energy coming from this side of town, and we know that it is the inspiration for those who continue to build today. Ashe, and to those whose names we can never recall, but are here in our hearts, we pour to you. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe O. Oh.
and so it is. Something in spirit said, hey man, you got a Palo Santo stick sitting there. The ancestors said, light a little of that Palo Santo. Uh, for those of you who have the little wood sticks, they're becoming popular now. Palo Santo is a wood that's grown off the cool coast of Argentina, and it literally translates as holy wood. When you burn that Palo Santo energy, it's like sage. It's like copal. You cleanse the space. So I'm happy to be in this space. I'm grateful to be in this space, and we're grateful to have you in this space. So it's time for us to say good morning to you. Y'all give some snaps up, some energy up for Sister Kanitha. She's going to come in and lead us through good morning to you. And I'm going right. to challenge you because I'm going to the video monitor. And Sister yes. Kanitha, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off one thing that each of you is grateful for. So I want you to do two things. I want you, yeah, <laughs> I want you to tell us where you're checking in from. So send us a shout out. Tell us you're coming in from Ohio or Cincinnati or Chicago. Where are you coming from? Tell us that and give us one thing that we're grateful for. Sing along with us. Good morning to you. And we say a da 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 Good morning to you. A good morning to you. Good morning to you. All right. What do we have here? Who's checking in? Where y'all checking in from? Because I'm giving it to y'all. We got it going on in this place. We got Sister Addison checking in from Clifton, Tennessee. Sea town because Addison is there and she is grateful for awareness and a community of like-minded friends. Love you, Sister Addison. Good to see you. Good to have you in today. Sister Trezana is checking in from Cincinnati, OH, Ohio in the place. Grateful for life. Lab is checking in from Philly, Pennsylvania, the PA. Love it. Up the street, we got Shakia Bonnie Bonnie Boucher checking in. Grateful from around the corner, north side, northeast side, <laughs> northwest side. We up in the spot today. Natasha's checking in from Madison, Tennessee. Sister Kanitha, come on over here and chill with us as we got people checking in. Yes. Have a seat. I got a seat for you. Well, thank you. I'm grateful for you today. Thank you. And, and, and as gratitude is streaming in, as check-ins and shout-outs from different cities, what city are you repping today are Yay. coming in? I'm sending a shout out to our across the street neighbor at Infinity Fellowship, Brother Micah Freeman. Yes. Uh, shout out to your brother if you're watching uh, and to the entire Freeman clan over yes. there, the family over there. We're sending you a shout out, man. If y'all don't understand, I, I don't know the degree but in terms of the, the tilt of the hill, but oh, Lord, this it's one of those hills when you get to the bottom of it. The first thing you look up and you say, oh, Lord. <laughs> Then at the bottom, there's a curve, and we were able to get to the bottom of the curve and get down to the driveway, and we figured that the driveway was starting to melt. We got a concrete driveway entry, and so uh, the, the idea was I was going to start digging out the tracks with a snow shovel, and I got a couple of feet in, and I heard the scraping sound. I looked behind me, and my na our neighbor across the street was on the other side helping us dig out, so he yeah. dug out, and so we're here safe. Uh, because of you, Freeman, we appreciate that, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Good. It's just good neighborly yeah. thing, man. It's like when when the, when the book says who is my neighbor, and say which one did the neighborly oh, thing. So one a good one a, good, a year of alignment, ain't it? <laughs> yes. Ain't it a year of alignment? I love yes. it. We love it. All right, we got uh, trees. The borough, Murfreesboro, yeah. Tennessee. Woo, 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 grateful woo. for forty nine trips through the through life today. Oh. Happy birthday, trees. Happy birthday, birthday Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Tim 
taser. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yes. Yes, we are today the voices of infinity as well, yes. mm-hmm. which we all right with. It's all Shout right. out to brother Elijah Reggie Wooten. Yes. We love you, brother, wherever <laughs> you are, because you're in the world doing your thing on Third yes. Sundays, and we're grateful yes, for you. Uh-huh. <sighs> you know what? Sunday's Carmen, church should man. be this fun. And Carmen, we send a shout out to you, Carmen, yes. wherever you are. And wh- whether you're watching with us now or mm-hmm. whether you're going to wait till afterwards and scroll to the end, we still love you. <laughs> we love them. We love them. Stay with us. We are in there. <laughs> we are in the house today, yes. and it's a wonderful space. So we let me shout out some more folks because this is Third Sunday, and I get to we get to talk to y'all more and this is a place to see where you're repping from. So we've got people repping from, I know we've got a, all the way, we got the borough, 49 years, Trees, you're one year away from 50. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 40s are amazing. Wait till you hit 50. Uh, shout out to Sister uh, Joy. Uh, and, and, and Joy Gillum is one of the finest artists in the world, trailblazing artists. She's been celebrating 50 years. Uh, I've been sending her shout out. She's a Tennessean, Nashville, Tennessean daughter mm-hmm. of the great Joe Gillum a quarterback at TSU and, and legendary NFL quarterback, and she's just been going in about how liberating 50 is. Mm. And it's a liberating thing because you're old enough to know what you're doing and you're 50, so you're young enough to still do it. So it's yeah. a wonderful space yeah. to be in. So Denise is checking in woo, from woo, Nashville, uh-oh. Tennessee. My family's <laughs> grateful to welcome our newest addition, oh. two-month-old Kane Corso dog named Duchess Athena. Oh, cool. well, all right. She flew in from Romania oh. on Wednesday. Yes. She's come from Romania. All right. We now have another member of Infinity from yeah. around the world, from Romania. We have a <laughs> Romanian canine who is strong and powerful. Do not mess with this dog. Mm-mm. Bring her on over anytime. From the borough, sister, oh, we got Rihanna coming in from Nashville. Oh. Tennessee. I had one a little higher, though. I know I had one a little higher. I had, uh, right, but yeah, we got Sister Angie coming in from Murfreesboro. Grateful for life, breath, and family. Cindy, CW, Maryland, grateful for this sunny day. Come on, Maryland. Maryland's got the sun in there. Come on, share some of that sunlight. We got some of it here. Uh, We got Sister uh, Felina is just grateful. Heart yes. goes out to those dealing yes. with the effects of the storm and weather. Yes. Being yes. from Wisconsin, we're used to it. Sure. Mm-hmm. We were talking about that yesterday. We were. we were like, look at those big piles of snow, snow. Yeah, I said, wait till you not. go. We were like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> wait till you go to Milwaukee or Minnesota Man, y'all. and you see those drifts. But yeah, we're so great low. for it. Uh, but definitely, Felina, yes. uh, being great yes. in Wisconsin, we're used to it and not take it for granted. Awesome. Yes. Michelle Mayberry. Good to see you, Michelle. Checking in from Dallas, Texas. Ah. Grateful for my life. Grateful that all my family and friends are safe. Good. Smile. Good. Sending love to y'all, Good. Texas. Yes. We sending love to y'all. Yes. We got all the family and friends down there that we're loving yes. on. Sister Rosetta from Chicago. Grateful for my beloved family, the breath of life, the ability to conference with like-minded people and enthusiast people on Zoom. Yes. Love it. This has been a great season for getting knowledge and information. We got a day of that today, too. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really, really good and wisdom, most importantly. Uh, Good morning, Gregory Van Leer, Sir Killing, a senior, Killing, Texas. Grateful for no power outage and no frozen pipes. Oh, come on. Wow. Wow. I love it. Texas is in the house today. Y'all say hey to my mama. She's down there in Texas with my sister Gussie. Shout out to my sister and bre- brother-in-law Randy, uh, and everybody. And Eaton's down there too. My son, my my and nephews shout in Spain. Out to my sister and my nieces and nephews. Katrina, and my brother, we love you. Rob, we father, love you. All, everybody. Everybody's in Texas. Texas. We got a yeah. lot, you know. Everybody yeah. And and shout out. I, I, all my exes live in Texas. That's yeah. a song. Only, well. only a couple of my exes <laughs> live in Texas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, my well, exes. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Oh, good morning. <laughs> there are yes. some people who say church should not be this. Church, church should be this fun. This is what it's supposed to be on Sundays Lord for everybody. Day. Happy Born Day. Love y'all. And, and, and hey, great. We're, we're on a live chat, so if somebody says something, I'll always shower them with likes and hearts yes. and muscle arms and congratulations. Yes. Be- believe me, they feel it. Yes. 
and, and they tell us and you email us, we feel the love when it's being shared uh, and we're in there. Rosetta is grateful for the life of Mama Jacqueline Jackie Hunt, a strong influential elder in our community who made her transition yesterday. Aww. Was happy that she was part of my life. Jackie Hunt, yes. you're in that libation energy. Yes. It's yes, probably yes. what made me pull, pull the, uh, pull the uh, Palo Santo out today. Uh -huh. Sister Hunt's energy, that elder energy of that tree, mm. that tree connected root yeah. energy. That's it. Come on in alignment. We're in here. AJ, good day, infinity day. Dwight Neteru in there with the ancestors. Thank you. Yes. Gratitude yes. for the Neteru, the energy, that Orisha, that cosmic energy of guidance, that God got us energy. Thank you. Duat Deteru. I love it when the comedic energy come comes up now. in this play. We better come on and talk. <laughs> you be talking in that stuff, man. We're in here. When we talk about the Sheps and the Shep suit, we get into all of that. That's ancient wisdom. We're coming back up. We saw Gussie on Zoom Friday. She was definitely on Zoom oh. with John Carlos, and we had to, just a great Zoom there with Greg and everyone. Addison's thankful for life and us guys and how fun it is here. Us too. Lynn, Lynn, what's up, Lynn? <laughs> We ain't seen you in a month of Sundays, girl. We're so glad you're joining us today, Lynn. And you staying safe down here. Yes. Uh, I think Lynn's in, 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 in ATL, I think. I want to make sure that we know that. But we're in there. Uh, we got this energy to get together. Uh, we love you guys. Thanks yes. for checking in and letting yes. us know. We're going to be interacting with you soon. In a, in, in, and we're going to have a good time. It's third Sunday. And on third Sunday, we have the time of our lives. I'm going to turn it over to Sister Kanitha for our statement of infinitude. Oh, yeah. Pass me the word. Pass us the pass. Well, good morning, Infinity. And welcome again to the Infinity Experience live online. So there's always a couple of reminders that we like to give you all every Sunday to remind you. One is that we don't want to tell you what to call or how to define the God of your own personal acceptance and understanding. That is an intensely unique, personal, beautiful relationship. But here at Infinity, we just simply affirm that unique connection. Number two, whatever you call that source energy, you'll hear us say God interchangeably with the universe, divine source. What you see around you, baby, is the proof that it was showing off when you were created after the same image and likeness. So now it's time to speak aloud the core agreements that bring us together at infinity. We call that infinitude. Infinitude is defined in the dictionary as the state or quality of being infinite or having no limit. We have a mix of unique a unique mix of faiths, backgrounds at Infinity, but what centers us is the spirituality we all share in common. For us, Infinitude is defined as infinity Woo! with an attitude, because I'm going to get my snap on. And that attitude is gratitude, and the snap you just heard is the spiritual practice that gives us life and meaning. Snap is on your screen, and we recommend you take some time to meditate on both it and our statement of infinitude by visiting our website at myif.org. So the S in snap is for spirituality that transcends religion and connects you to the God of your own understanding. The N in snap is for nurturing of ourselves and others, mind, body, and spirit. The A is for action because we take action on our callings and walk in our divine purpose every day and finally the p is for the proof that it that our spiritual practices manifest fruit in our lives through the building and maintaining of healthy and prosperous families relationships careers and dreams and etc 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 we are grateful you all are here as unique manifestations of our creator, the loving, living spirit of our commonality, the divine source of all creation, perceived by many names, yet known by only one energy. I invite you to join us in the affirmation of our statement of infinitude. We, we agree, agree that, that we, we are beings of pure, pure eternal spirit, birthed from the creative potential of the universe, with all the powers of the creator inherent within us. 
We embrace the innate goodness of humankind and an abundant creation that provides for us through the seeds that we plant in our everyday lives. We acknowledge that who we are is housed in a temporary biological organism, and as such, it is our responsibility to take care of it because it will only last for a precious window of time. As we nurture ourselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, we commit to provide like acts of nurturing for our fellow brothers and sisters of the world we live in, embracing all regardless of religious faith, skin color, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic background. All are truly welcome at infinity. We agree and accept that various religions exist as a unique opportunity for humanity to get to know one another through meaningful conversations that seek to explore the core concepts we share in common. It is the application of ancient wisdom, scientific discovery, and spiritual practices, both physical and metaphysical, that will lead us closer together as a human family. We commit to exist now and ever as a beloved community. Let it be so according to the many ancient terms of affirmation. Amen. Amen. Amin. Amin. Hotep. Hotep. Shalom. Shalom. Namaste. Namaste. Ashe. Ashe. Deep breath in. Exhale to release. That's how we bring it all together here, yeah? That's how we do it in this space. That's the power of welcoming that energy into where we are. So as we uh, listen to the sounds of peace, peace, I want to do our visitors welcome. If you're a first time visitor, then I want you to type first time in the box. Type first time in the box and watch what will happen. People will shower you with love, with muscle arms, with high fives. They're gonna give you all of the love in the space. So please let us know who you are. Today is the day that the God of your acceptance and understanding is made. It's a moment to rejoice, to be glad, uh, to open up your heart in a wonderful space. We thank you for tuning in to Infinity. To our first time visitors, we like to let you know that we know exactly who, what, where, when, and why you are, even though we may have never met you. You may be sending your energy in from across the world. You might be right up the block. But whatever got you here, it was not on accident. Trust me, you have found your way to the core of consciousness in a space where people recognize and see the real you. So we don't see you as a human being who showed up today to have a spiritual experience. You're gonna have that. But the reality is that you are a spirit who's navigating the human experience like the rest of us. And so we like to hold our hands up to you. For those of you who are at home, if you've got people around you, hold your hands up to them. Hold your hands up back to the screen, knowing that you're talking to everybody around the world. Cross your hands over your heart if you're a visitor. Close your eyes and imagine all of these hands all over the world saying this to you. Deep breath in. Exhale to release. And on behalf of the Infinity Fellowship, we say to you, I see you, but you don't hear me though. I really see the real you. I see who you are. You are a divine manifestation of God's creation. I see what you are. You are a spirit. You're more than what's on the outside. You are a gift to me and to the entire world. I see where you are. You're right here in front of me. Where I can let you know that you're not alone. I'm with you and you're at home. I see when you are. You're in the right now, baby. You are so much more than your yesterday. I see why you are. You're here to learn, to grow, to embrace your dreams, and to celebrate your divine destiny. I know all this because I'm here to do the same thing. So we're going to help each other out. All right? 
I, I know the real you, and I see you shining today. I feel you shining today. I know you're shining today. So welcome home. Welcome to infinity. Asheo! Move it, get up and groove it, get up and move it, get up. Mm, mm. I'm getting up and I'm walking to the podium, my favorite part of the service. Grab my phone, get my groove on, mm, mm. get my groove on. We used to do three to the right, mm. and then three to the left, and then three to the back, and then pause, then hit it. Then don't do no more, because you got to get service going. You got to keep it rolling. <laughs> Good morning again, Infinity. Uh, we want to take that energy, carry that love energy into our sacred giving moment. This is the moment where we get to pour back into the Infinity Fellowship, the space that gives us our spiritual food. Giving is such an important part of every spiritual community. It's an important part of any community. If you are a part of a community, real talk is Black History Month time now. But if you are a part of a community where you get fed and you get nurtured and you don't do any feeding or any nurturing, there's a name for that. It's a scientific name for that. That's something that pulls but does not return. So we are excited to be a part of a community where we don't have a parasitic relationship with folks. Uh, we don't just pull, pull, pull. We pour, pour, pour. And we do that as an institution, but we do that as individuals as well. How awesome is it to come to a space that feels like this every Sunday? How awesome is it to come to a space where if you're stuck in the middle of the week, you can get an affirmation meditation? How awesome is it to come to a space where you can get married and affirmed for who you are and who you love with affirmation and not just toleration? And how awesome is it to have a space, a physical space that you can come to for community education, for workshops, for housing, for youth development, for performing arts and the academies. How awesome is that? I think it's the greatest thing in the world. And that's why we celebrate through the act of giving back. This is the moment where we give according to however we've received. And if you're living, if you're loving, if you're breathing, you received and it's a great thing. You can say everything is good. I got through these snowy streets, y'all. Everything is good. I got through uh, being stuck in the house and we couldn't get out. And I got through a three mile walk with Kanitha to the grocery store and got there and back. My limbs were sore, I had to take a bath and some Epsom salt, but hey, I got there and back. And the kids made it on a journey to, to go down to the, the, the McDonald's uh, the next day and they were so excited to get there to get to the window and, and, and the lady said, you know, we're sorry, we're only doing cars, drive through. And instead of walk through all of that snow, <laughs> almost two miles, and the lady came out, she said, no, 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 I'm going to make sure y'all get covered. And this is how the universe looks out for us, in unexpected ways. So when you give, it's not a roulette game. You don't invest, and then all of a sudden, it's going to start coming into your bank account. That, that happens, and people have stories, too. But the reality is, when you are a giver, you release the, the spirit of lack that keeps you from receiving. Go back and watch that message on that vibrational energy from a week or so ago. But we are in this space of giving, and you can give through Cash App, you can give through PayPal, you can even put it in the mail and send it to us at 641 West Nocturne Drive, and we receive it there as well. We'll put a slide up in a minute. Uh, if you are a tither, we appreciate you. That's why this place is expanding the way it is. There are people who have said, you know what? 10% of my food, of my, my money that I come in, that I get, that I receive, I take 10% of that, whatever comes in, and I pour it back into the space that provides my spiritual food. That is the act of tithing. It is the act in ancient times, and ancient wisdom, of first fruits. It is the concept that bore the history of Kwanzaa. It is the concept that bore the festival days in Kemet, making sure that we take care of our spiritual spaces. Offering is also just giving what is on top of your heart to give. So if you're giving today, take a deep breath and meditate with me. And let's recognize that that energy 
is manifest through the money, and the money is simply energy. It's a statement to say, here's what's important to me. So we thank you for that. We don't do a long pitch. We don't do the guilt whip thing. We just love to be a part of people who love to give because it amplifies our vibration. Allow your eyes to close. Say with me, everything is good. Say it again, everything is good. Say, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it good. On the screen, we'll have our offertory affirmation. We're going to say it aloud, and we're going to supercharge our offering with that affirmation. Trust me, when you say this and when you're giving, you feel it and you know it. Let's say it together. Oh, limitless, abundant creator, source, source of, of everything, everything I, possess. I possess, you, you have, have given, given me the gifts of life, life breath, and, and creativity. creativity. You, you continue, continue to, to provide for me without judgment or preference. Or and so, so I freely return these gifts to you with my whole heart, mind, and intention, knowing that as I give freely, with both remembrance and gratitude, the circle of abundance will be unbroken, and so it is. Ah, yes. The ways to give are on the screen. If you're watching on your computer, you can just hold your phone up to the code, give by cash app. Or you can go to your cash app now and give at dollar sign Infinity Fellowship. You can mail to Infinity Fellowship, 641 West Nocturne Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. You can also do PayPal securely anywhere in the world. PayPal.me backslash Infinity Fellowship. Let us give. Y'all can sing a song along with Sister Kenesha. Once I figure out how to sing and do my cash app at the same time, I'm going to join in. So I'm going to do the cash app first, and then I'm going to join in. Everything is good. Sister Kanitha. Yes. You awesome. Thank you for today. I thank you for that lovely shirt that says, yes. I am a strong melanin what? HBCU what? queen with a tad what? bit of sass and a what? whole lot of class. class. Huh? Huh? What? Yes. What? Uh. I'm going to give a little bit more about this for standing ovations. A little more in standing ovations. <laughs> I love it. Sister yes. Kenise is going to give us our announcements for today. Excellent. We love it. Thank you. Good. So again, 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 and again, good morning, Infinity. As always, this is the time. If you've got something great that you want to report as a standing ovation, let's go ahead and type it in right now so it'll be ready when we get to that part of the service. So again, if something has happened for you this week and you want us to shout you out, Go ahead, 
type that in the chat box at this time, and when it comes to standing ovations, we'll be ready for you. All right, welcome to February, the second month of 2021, the year of alignment. Our daily mantra is, everything's going my way, and we sing it, everything's going my way good we speak that you are being safe at home and embracing this opportunity to explore your spirituality on a deeper level than ever before here are a couple of important reminders of things happening here at infinity our affirmation meditation call is every Wednesday. Again, our affirmation meditation call is every Wednesday. No matter who you are or what your spiritual path is, we could all use an uplift during the week. So join our affirmation meditation call every Wednesday at 12 noon Central Standard Time for an energizing meditation poured into realignment for manifestation. The number is on your screen. Take a quick photo come on put that photo in and lock it in so you'll be ready for that Wednesday meditation call all right y'all guess what guess what guess what next week is yoga Sunday woo, 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 woo. every fourth Sunday we move all the chairs here and participate in a moving meditation message and realignment known globally as yoga Sunday that's for real y'all we really do yoga for our service on Sunday so next Sunday Rev Jeff will be leading us through the new infinity flow it's part vinyasa part Iyengar I think I said that right. Help me out there. It's um, and a complete alignment practice that you can incorporate in your life. So join us next week for the world's only Yoga Sunday. Yoga Sunday is for all levels, even first timers. So don't leave me hanging because I will be on the mat. So I want everybody all live, live to join us for that. Get your mat ready at home and we'll get your body in alignment with your mind and spirit. Okay. Okay, all right, next one, Corks and Conversations is coming up. As promised, our epic event for married couples is back in the virtual space. Friday, March 5th at 7 p.m. Jump into the event that supports you and your spouse, your family, and surround you with good spirits who understand that the journey is real. We'll have games, contests, and judgment-free conversations. CNC is a premier event that gives married folks a safe space to hold each other up in positive vibrations. You often discover that you're not alone in what you're going through. So Infinity, check your email for the free sign-up link, and today the direct link is in the chat. So the direct link is in the chat. Click on it, Mary Folk, and reserve your spot from wherever you are. All right. It's time for standing ovations. <laughs> It's why we snap our fingers during this part of the service. We receive practical lessons and tools for our individual journeys. That's spirituality. Yes. We fellowship with like-minded spirits every week. That's nurturing. We take what we learn and we apply it in our lives. That's action. Yes. And if we do these, then every week we see progress in our lives. That's the proof. Yes. So let us pause to enjoy a collective moment of manifestation and expansion. We'll call off your names and manifestations as we receive them. When your name is called, we will snap our fingers to celebrate and affirm you and then provide a collective standing ovation at the end. All right, y'all. So I'm going to scoop over. She's here. tossing it over to me. I'm over here. I'm going to come up back up there and dance with you, though. So I'm going to come back over and dance with you. Nice. Oh, yeah. do you want me to stay over there? Yeah. You want to stay right there? Because oh. we're going to cut back and forth. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. I got my setup Look, for we're trying to, we're my trying conversation. To do we're trying to do something small. We're trying to be slick. We're trying to do production work. 
Yeah. Can I do slide. mine first, though? Can I give mine? Yes, let's cut away to Sister Kanitha, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so let me tell you about all of you all. Infinity women, huh? Infinity women always are on the leading edge. Yes. Always doing above and beyond. And what I wanted to give a shout out to my sister, Denise and brother D, Demetrius Knowles. They hooked me up, y'all. They hooked me up, okay? So my birthday, they gave me a little special something, something in the flavor of grape, okay? Um, and I appreciated that. I came, they brought it warm, and I was like, thank you. And I thought that was going to be it because that was good for me right there. Yes. Then I get presented with this shirt, y'all. So I had to rep it today. Woo! And this is for my birthday. And the, just that reminder of that inner queen always that inner queen and so i just appreciate that um so a shout out to them and just a shout out to all of you all out there women y'all we doing the dog on Come thing on. You ain't lying. and we gotta pat ourselves on the back and remember yes. that we are these queens always in our life so that's my standing ovation i <laughs> love it love it love it love it sister kenitha and she looks great in the shirt <laughs> And uh, th thank you, Brother D, Sister D, the D and D. We used to call them D and D Creations, D and D Promotions. Yeah. They definitely put it down. Vitamin D, uh, always looking out for folks. And thank you for that. It, it's just it was a wonderful moment. And I even got the presentation on videotape. I'm keeping that. Uh, standing ovations. Let's go through and see what you got, Sister Addison. You've got a standing ovation. The kids and I were stuck in the house and had run out of groceries. But a neighbor checked on us and brought us some necessities. We are so blessed and divinely supported. Come on through, neighbors. Telling you, man, this is how it happens. You do good in the world and it gets paid forward. Yes. I, and last night, as, a, as an aside, as we're waiting on your stand ovations to come in, last night, as an aside, my neighbor uh, got us, helped us dig out to get here. Our neighbor, Infinity's neighbor, to get in. And we went to get some food. We said, let's get something special for the kids on the way home. Let's get some Ethiopian food. And I positioned myself in the parking lot where I could easily get out because I lined myself in these tracks. And this young man came out of the space, uh, and he had put himself in a place where he could not get out. So <laughs> he went up the hill going out of the parking lot, and he got stuck. And uh, I said, you know what? Uh, it's freezing out there, but I put this snow shovel in my car. My neighbors next door pushed our car out. Somebody dug us out to get here. So let me get out of this car as a stranger. And I know he was, it took him a minute because here's this six foot two figure in this hulking hood in the dark with this shovel coming up in his rear view mirror. So I know it was a little unnerving. And then I went to the other side and I had the shovel. He's like, oh, I said, like, here, here's how you do. And I shoveled the parking lot and cleared enough space. And when he left, I just went ahead and shoveled some more. So Kanitha came out and said, did you get a discount for the food? Because I surely have cleared their parking lot for them, for their customers. <laughs> but it was good to pay it forward. So Sister Addison, that's how it works. Woo -woo. That's how the universe work it, where it compensates for itself. Yes. And that's how it goes. Standing ovation. Denise knows D in the house in the month of March for the third time. I will have an article featured in the International Online Mar Magazine, Off the Bench. Woo! Get your subscription today. Off the Bench. So, yes. Denise, we're basically saying that you are a regular columnist for Off the Bench Magazine. <laughs> yes. That's third yes. month in a row, that's a regular com columnist, right? Two times you're a guest. Third time you're a columnist. Yeah. So, Off the Bench Magazine, you all. Sister Denise is out there writing and coaching and doing her thing. Sister Rosetta up in the shy, standing whoop, old. Whoop, whoop, whoop. My nephew, Jimmy, shoveled the Chicago snow. Mm. That ain't that's Alabama a snow. That's a different snow. Chicago, because Chicago snow. Chicago snow is, a is another one. snow. <laughs> that's why they have the show Chicago PD, Chicago Fire. Uh, There's a different thing in Chicago. Snow. My nephew, Jimmy, shoveled the Chicago snow, dug my car out. Mm. So I was able to go out on Friday to the post office, the grocery store, to work, and made it safely home. Woo! Come on, family. Woo, woo, woo. Come on, nephews. Yes, yes, Come on, yes. community. 
Y'all better look out for each other. Y'all better look out for each other. Good. I had a check-in. A little sc scrolling up a little bit, Sister Alicia. I had a check-in earlier from a new si checking in from Memphis Lavelle. We see you. Whoop, whoop. Good to have you in from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, when I was coming up, we call it the One Town, Bluff City. Then Nashville got a little bit bigger, and we were considered the one town because it was about the license plate used to have one, two, based on the city size that you were in. Then they got rid of that. But you're still the one town in our hearts. Bluff City, baby. Memphis, Tennessee. Rihanna is in the house, our superstar, liberating herself and others all the time. Yeah. Standing ovation, putting it up on the screen. For my beloved who is coordinating rapid response and supplies for our people across the mm. South, especially in Mississippi. Mm. Mm, 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 Grateful mm. to be in love and alignment with someone who shares my heart. Oh, come on! Ain't nothing oh. like the real yeah, thing, thing, baby. Ain't nothing, nothing like, like the real thing. thing. I could go on about that. <laughs> oh, y'all, that's awesome. So look. We shared our ovations. We appreciate you sharing, and you know how we do it. Um, if you are a person who shared an ovation, we want you to just sit in your chair or sit down wherever you are. We can, oh, we got one more. You tell me which one. Okay, I'm going to tell this for Alicia. <laughs> uh, Alicia pointed to me. She said, you can tell mine. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to send a shout out to Sister Alicia Hamer, who is behind the screens, making mm -hmm. sure everything is running. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to go nuts for her on the, on the feed, because we always do. Sister Alicia Hamer booked, and this would be the first, I think. It, she, burst, bur she, she has manifested. Y'all know she's an actor, what? director, writer, playwright. She has manifested her first SAG-AFTRA union film as one of the what did they call it secondary leads this uh, yeah. in other words she's one of the main characters y'all and she will be filming starting this week for a holiday movie that will be airing for christmas give it up We got movie stars Woo! in the house, y'all. We got movie stars. We got, movie, we got movie stars. stars. We got movie stars. We got movie stars. We got movie stars. We got moving cars. We got everything you need. Hey. Okay, so obviously I have some coffee energy to burn off. So if you shared, sit down. You can put your hands over your heart and receive this. You can put your arms open in the sky. You can beat your chest, whatever it is. But everybody else who did not share, if you're at home, in a car, wherever you are, if you can, stand up and join us in giving a rousing standing ovation for everybody who has something awesome happen to them this week. so grateful to be able to be in a space today for the message to not have to do this message alone I let you know I never do the messages alone I'm always here with you with spirit uh, but I'm also excited to have this conversation today so for those of you who are ready for a powerful conversation as a as a message today we want you to begin to meditate around a higher state of consciousness. I miss y'all in person. We all miss you in person. 
And one of the energies that we get from this space when we come here uh, is a space of affirmation of the, el the elders. And we sing an old song that intros us to the message today. And I've got a great, special, awesome guest coming in from down in the loo. Uh, but we start today by singing a simple song that reminds us that where we take our consciousness is a special place of love, of power, of wisdom, and we absolutely want to go to that space. So I invite you to sing along with me at home. Let's resonate this energy to the world for a verse or two. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound, oh, come and go to that land, come and go to that land, come and go to that land, where I'm bound, oh, there is love in that land. There is love in that land. Uh, there is love in that land. Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Uh, there is love in that land. Uh, there is love in that land. Oh, there is love. In that land where I'm bound, oh, there is a wisdom in that land. Oh, there is wisdom in that land. Oh, there is wisdom in that land. Oh, where I'm bound, where I'm bound, there is wisdom. Oh, there is wisdom in that land. Oh, there is wisdom in that land. Where I'm bound, oh, all of my people, they're in that land. All of my people are in that land. Oh, all of my people are in that land. Oh, where I'm bound, where I'm bound, I say that all of my people are in that land, and all of my people gone on to that land, all of, all of my people in that land, where I'm bound, oh, don't you want to go to that land? I don't you wanna go to that land? Don't you wanna go to that land? Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Oh, don't you? Don't you wanna go to that land? Don't you wanna go to that land? Oh, don't you wanna go? To that land where I'm bound. Deep breath in there, feel that gratitude. I can feel y'all from all over, man. What an awesome moment it is. Today I'm going to uh, welcome in to the room Dr. Jerome E. Morris, and then I'm gonna do today's meditation and get to a space where we can share. Uh, 
I'm only going to read a couple of paragraphs of an extensive bio for this brother that you see and popping up on the screen here today. Uh, this brother is a powerful spirit, a very powerful spirit. Uh, Dr. Jerome Morris is the E. Desmond Lee Endowed Professor of Urban Education in conjunction with St. Louis Public Schools and a research fellow with the Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Missouri St. Louis. His research is grounded in sociology, anthropology, school reform, and urban studies. And his investigations have been based in urban and suburban centers. As a social scientist, Dr. Morris's scholarship reflects a deep and abiding familiarity with communities, families, and schools. The nexus of race, social class, and place is a major theme of Dr. Morris's scholarship. He has been in the forefront of highlighting the centrality of the U.S. South in understanding black folks' experiences. Since arriving in St. Louis in August of 2015, Dr. Morris has been researching the meaning of the area's decades-long desegregation plan for race and opportunity in greater St. Louis, as well as leading a multi-regional Southwest and Midwest investigation of the academic and racial socialization of black students for STEM fields. Uh, we can go from there. Uh, I will say that this brother here on this screen with me uh, has, has been around Infinity before. For those of you who remember Coleman Park, uh, he came and presented with his wonderful right. kids. Uh, he and his wonderful wife, Mary Muse, uh, have some awesome young people. I'm getting him back at another point. He's going to do a workshop for me. He doesn't know. Uh, but <laughs> in addition to being scholars, uh, they are also family folks. They homeschool both of their kids, and both of their kids are at prestigious university, Washington University and Stanford right now uh, under the tutelage of their parents pouring into them. So I can't say welcome enough uh, to this brother on the screen, but y'all give an infinity high five on the, on the chat box, and we're going to move him into position. Dr. Jerome E. Morris. Cue the screaming and applause <laughs> in the background. We got you, Doc. Good to have you, hey, man. Can you hear us? Good morning, Infinity family. Good morning, Reverend <laughs> Carr. Good morning, team. Good Sister morning, team, brother. Carr. <laughs> I love the way she does it. <laughs> good hey, morning, team. Good morning. Right, so what we're we going to do, Jerome, we're going to start uh, with today's meditation. I'm going to put it up okay. on the screen. You should be able to see it. All right. Uh, today's meditation is coming to us. Uh, from Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and uh, we're going to, it, we're, we're rocking that thing today. I love it. I love it. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and as we know, Dr. Carter G. Woodson is the founder of Black History Month, as we know it, starting with Black History Week, and I think I should be able to go off mic. Yes, I think I'm good. I think I'm clear. Philosophers have long conceded, however, that every man has two educators, that which is given to him and the other that and the other that which he gives himself. Of the two kinds, the latter is by far the most desirable. Indeed, all that is most worthy in man, he must work out and conquer for himself. It is that which constitutes our real and best nourishment. What we are merely taught seldom nourishes the mind like that which we teach ourselves. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, two types of education. As we come back in this space today, as we begin this conversation today, uh, Doc, I want to say thanks for taking the time out today. Man, well, I know you're, you're highly in demand in a lot of different places, but this conversation uh, today is around a topic, uh, and that is how do we reconnect ha humanity through Black History Month? When we talk about the history of Black History Month, I think about uh, Dr. John Henry Clark. Right. Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, a wonderful scholar, and teacher, elder, I had the opportunity to, to meet him, get to know him uh, yes. on, on, a, on a great level. Uh, my brother was one of his personal mentees and just phenomenal intellect, phenomenal spirit. One thing Dr. John Henry Clark talked about when he talked about black history or, or African history, he said that there's no such thing as 
uh, black history or white history, African history or European history. There's only history. However, African history and the history of African people, black history, are the pages that have been torn out of the book. So our job is to reinsert the pages for the sake of all humanity. Right. Uh, the question I want to get, and I want to give you some room to just share, why okay. should we celebrate? We got so many people who are tuned in from so many different places and so many different cultures here. Why is it important that we celebrate this thing called Black History Month? And how did it originate? We got to go one on one sometimes. Okay. How did it originate and where yeah. did we get to where we are? Well, now? It, is all, it has always been in existence in terms of this understanding of who we are. Ancient people from Kemetic, we call ancient Egyptian people, Nubian, Ethiopia. You know, all these people have always had ways of understanding who they are. So history was ongoing or a study of the present or their existence was all ongoing. But we're dealing with here in the United States in what we call the African diaspora or the black diaspora. We are really dealing with the issue of um, recentering this whole issue around who we are. And I'm going to use one of Dr. John Henry Clark's quotes also that you had, you know, you mentioned Dr. Clark. He said, if you start our history, meaning you start black people's history with enslavement, then everything else looks like progress. And so we have mm, to that's good. That. If you start with enslavement, everything else looks like progress. Then we start saying things the first this, the first that, rather than understanding that people have already done these, it's just been in a different form, in a different context. And so we always have to be mindful of that. The other thing, um, you asked the question about um, black history and the founding of, so in terms of officially here in the United States, Negro history, we, we know Dr. Carter G. Woodson, you referenced, and I love that quote, I teach a class of about 30 students, and these are educators. Well, you know, I work with them and I have them in my class and I always begin the class, and even in an undergraduate class, I begin with that quote that, and I let them know, I say, I want you to understand that when you come to my classroom, that you're expecting me to teach you, but the most important aspect of learning is that which you teach yourself. I always let them know that. And I also let them know that um, when they're coming into this classroom, this is a different model of education. This is um, a Western centered model in which I'm just meeting you and you are expected to trust that I'm going to teach you. And so in essence, you are being taught by stranger, a stranger. This is the model which our children are facing. It was more familiar, albeit during segregation, we call um, modern contemporary apartheid. You know, it was familiar for black children in an all black setting. And I'm talking about K 12, I'm not talking about HBCUs. I'm saying for 100 plus years in the United States, it was familiar, but it flipped in terms of when the implementation of Brown versus Board of Education, the form of desegregation, it flipped and became something that became stranger. You were taught by strangers. So I let them know that, that this modern notion of schooling is really about, it's a strange model. And one is expected the teacher who doesn't know who you are to teach you. So I, I want all of that to be clear. And so this is why Dr. Carter G. Wooden said we have to have Negro History Week because black children almost overwhelmingly in predominantly black settings increasingly were being taught by white people. And there was a decentering of black people in terms of this whole human history. And Dr. Carter G. Woodson recognized to bring that into existence in Negro history in 1926, around 1926. People try to come up with official dates. And then around 1976, around that time, I believe it becomes Negro History Month or Black History Month. And that's when I saw it, you know, in terms of, I grew up in Birmingham. Man, I love it when you went back to the old school, you know, church. You know, that's one of the reasons why us black folks didn't go to church enough because we couldn't get that old school stuff. And I remember um, growing up in Birmingham, we went to church sometime. We were 
urban black folks, you know, or new urban black people living in housing projects. So I, I, I was about to say, Jerome, this, you, I'm about to say, because we're being yeah. academic, that you grew up in the projects. In I grew up in the projects in Birmingham. And in 35203, I represent an area called Central City. And one of the things, it arguably was the poorest zip code in the United States. It's in the South, it's in Birmingham, the battleground for the civil rights movement. And I say that because when I was listening, when you brought us into that spirit, you know, it took me back to Birmingham. It took me back to my mother, my grandmother, the ancestors who nurtured me, the community that nurtured me. And it, it reminded me of why I'm here. And it, it also was a testament to even the educators who taught me in Birmingham. I went to a school called Powell Elementary School. And we had teachers who were teaching us and they were almost the remnants of that old school model. And so fortunately I was on that tail end of that. And I caught these people who were really other mothers to us. And they taught us just like we should have been taught in African villages. You know, when, we, when education wasn't going to a place that was sitting among the elders, Du Bois talked about this, that when he went and viewed Africa, went and visited, even during this period, you could see that young people didn't go to school, they sat among elders and the elders taught them the wisdom of the, the tribe, taught them the history, taught them the sciences, taught them the myths, taught them um, what it meant to become a man and a woman. What was it, how do you become one? What is your responsibility? He said, ultimately, there was no sense or no notion of an uneducated person. And so in essence, what we're doing is we are trying to create a form of education that centers us and affirms you. So education should be bringing you closer to who you are. It should never be a subtractive process. It should be always about enhancing or bringing you closer to who you are so you can understand. Mm -hmm. And I know we use yeah. these words manifest so you can really become manifested. And so that's what education is really about. And so when we were talking, I was thinking about Negro History Week and those teachers who worked with me who gave me that ground and gave many of us that ground. And we would have been... Um, suffered even more had it not been for them. So I thank them and I'm honored to be here for this. I mean, man, this is, this is great, Jerome, because I think one of the things that you pointed out, the centering of history, right? When yeah. you think about uh, Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, who yeah. wrote Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Yes. Uh, she, she had a really good understanding of what happens when you dehumanize people. Exactly. Right. So dehumanization of black people, of people of African descent, Negroes, you know, we go through this Afro-American, African-American, you know, whatever yeah. it is, we're still it's a struggle for reclaiming our center. Right. But if you say people of African descent, I'd say black folk. When you say mm -hmm. black folk are inherently inferior, that not only affects black people, but it affects white people and other people. Right. We consider themselves classified according to any number of social constructs that we create, but it affects them because it creates a space of cognitive dissonance. You, we've been having this conversation during this month about right. transatlantic slave trade and this reinsertion of these stories. It, it doesn't start here in America with slavery. Exactly. It starts thousands of years ago at the very center, the very origin of humanity. When you remove that, however, and you center whiteness or you center Europe or you center other spaces, right. what you do is you cause this, this thing that psychologists call cognitive dissonance because racism, white supremacy does not make sense mentally. There, the, 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 the layer of your skin, right? The epidermal right. layer of your skin is the, is the least difference in humanity. Right? We can talk about where you're yeah. from, but the shade of your skin is one of the minor differences. So right. to say that there is superiority based on simply the shade of your skin and that whiteness is at the top, it is completely insane. But because of that, you chip away at your own humanity when you buy into that model. Exactly. So in essence, it reinserting the stories of African people help all of humanity. Is it fair to say that? to come to a space where we see how we all fit together. You can't put together a puzzle without missing pieces, with the missing pieces. 
Right, and that, that's important. And one of the things is that I know we talk about this notion of, um, and we have to be careful too. Yes, whiteness or Eurocentric thought is pervading the world, but it's not dominating. You have the you have the Chinese people, Asian people, and the Chinese are saying, "Listen, we don't even engage in that conversation." I know, for example, <laughs> yeah. we learned in that's mathematics they have something called the Pythagoras theorem. The Chinese got another name for it. They name it after their person. And so what I'm saying is, this is what Europeans, but the Chinese say, we got at least 3,000 years. Okay, we don't even talk about that, but we're gonna work with you right now, alongside you, but we want to um, let it be known that whiteness doesn't run us. So that's what, you know, always Malcolm X talked about how during the 1960s, white people all over the world feared the rise of China. People still are. You know, fearing it. And I use that as an example to say, yes, white news is one, but there are competing views. You know, I'm thinking about um Chinawai Chavi says, even though something plants itself as truth, there will always be something else that'll come beside it and challenge it. So the Chinese have challenged it. As African people, we are challenging that thing. But let me just give a simple example. And we talk about paradigm shift in terms of what we have to have about this recentering, reclaiming, restoring who we are. Let me just give you a quick example. You ever see black folks sometimes, Jeff, with, um, he said, man, look at that. They got slanted eyes. They got eyes look like um, Asian <laughs> people or Chinese people. Yeah, and yeah I hear that. I, that. that. I, know, I know some people like that, yeah. Some people say, man, those, those black folks got Asian eyes. See, a paradigm shift or a, a model. I use the word paradigm, but we're going to shift the model. The a shift in model is not that those black folks got Asian eyes. You should be saying those Asians have the genes that black folks have with slanted eyes. That's really what's going on. You go to Togo and Benin and other countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you see it. Benin, but now that you go to Benin, so let's go to the Khorasan people, you know, like in Southern Africa. You've seen um, Nelson Mandela. You've seen him, right? He's got yeah. slanted eyes. Yeah. Have you seen those people in that part of the world? They have slanted eyes, so-called Asian-looking features. They're dark-skinned people. Here's what happened. African people, you can even take the most seemingly genetically diverse um, part outside of Africa, and Africans on the continent, and even us, as Africans who live in the diaspora, got more genetic diversity than any other group of people all over the world. Why? Because African people migrated out of the region. We call them modern humans. Modern humans left Africa and they took certain traits with them in certain little groups. And so there was a group that went and had those slanted eyes too, you know, and they took their no features they really emerge as a result of um, environmental necess necessity. And so, you know, you might have a gene, it might be dormant for that, but if you go into an area in which you need those, I think uh, those folds that they call, if you need those folds to guys, they'll emerge because humans trying to survive. If you need dark skin or more melanin, it'll produce more, your body will produce more melanin because Humans are trying to survive. And so what I'm saying is that Africans got all of that. And so I use the example with Asians for us to always think, when you see a person, say Naomi Osaka, and people say, she got Japanese features. No, those are African features. Hmm. Those are African features. And that's a century. And a group of people who are Africans became the model humans, they migrated and had a different, and those features became more prevalent, and we associated those with those people living in that region right now, but they all come out of Africa. So that's why Naomi Osaka, Osaka you know, when we talk about this notion of myth, no, she's African, and she's politically and, and ideologically and consciously African, too, you know, and the way she carries herself. So she's represented the best of who we are. And I admire, I love how she plays tennis. I love how she soundly wins. You know, she doesn't <laughs> play. So we had two African sisters competing, um, Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. 
surely. And and here's the interesting part, right? Because aside from Chris Everett's continually condescending commentary that she gives, I don't know how any just person allows her to continue with her comments, especially when she's talking about black mm -hmm. women. It's it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty ugly. It's pretty ugly spiritually. But mm -hmm. aside from that, we see these figures who are in history now. We're starting to see the movement towards sports that are not traditionally for us, right? right. And we see this rise and this energy of, uh, of sports being for us. I'm asking you this, and then I'm going to get to a place where we can ask a couple of questions from, from okay. people at home, because this, this conversation, man, you know we could do this forever. <laughs> we won't make sure we're mindful of the time. I want to give a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. uh, Y'all at home, uh, Jerome, his story is fascinating uh, because it's it's a story of opportunity. So, Jerome, if I could, if I could just blow your story up a little bit, correct me if wrong. Central City, uh, public housing, uh, the youngest of was it six? Six yeah. boys, youngest of six boys. I have a sister who's younger, and then I got some other siblings. My biological in your father. household, you were there was you and five brothers older. Five older brothers. Five older brothers, and y'all had to uh, work with your mom to kind of fend for yourself sometimes. Exactly, because your brothers weren't easy on you. Let's just say it like no, this: no. your family went the the streets weren't easy <laughs> on you. You had to stand up for yourselves, as often right. the youngest person has to do. Right? Yeah. Uh, football star, Phillips High School. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, scholarship, quarterback. Starting quarterback, could have played anywhere, played up the road at, at Austin P. Uh, traveled to Egypt, learned Arabic, was a scholar, president of fraternity. All of those things that you have here uh, started with, with your wife, Mary Muse, the cultural center at Austin P., the black cultural center at Austin P. Yeah. Came down and sat in with us in the 90s. Activist, uh, Vanderbilt University, PhD, uh, started the uh, uh, OB Gaps, which was the uh, organization for black, black graduate graduates. and professional students. Exactly. You had this energy here. So all of this stuff that you're doing, right, all of this energy, would you say that it's a matter of, when I think about juxtaposing that on, say, Venus and Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, Tiger Woods in golf, uh, the, the, the brothers who are breaking into hockey right now, we see right. that. Is it a matter of skill or is it a matter of opportunity because we've seen this thing we say well so black people historically don't have the aptitude to play quarterback right they don't have the aptitude to play golf they don't have yes. the aptitude to play chess is it a case of aptitude is it a case of opportunity well we know we know it's opportunity because we know when we get into those positions we can do well however one has to have the support along the way. So especially like at a quarterback position and in terms of quarterbacking, I went back and looked at some old news articles. You know, I didn't, um, I was a highly talented quarterback coming out of high school. I was honorable mention or second team all state in the state of Alabama, really the second highest ranked quarterback in the state out of Alabama and the offensive player of the year in the city of Birmingham, which is not lightweight, you know. So one of the things, um, so I had these aspirations, but like young, a lot of young black males coming out of public housing and family is struggling. We were dealing with economic trauma, racial trauma, didn't realize how poor we were, didn't realize how oppressive growing up in Birmingham was, but nevertheless, the ancestors were in me, my mother, my grandmother, and everybody, you know, I, I still had something that gave me some hope and light and told me to thrive and, and pursue and just go with the vengeance after things. I think my brothers, you know, they weren't light on me and um, I pushed through them and they made me tough. And so I have all of that with me. And fortunately, I, I did receive some opportunities in high school to travel to Japan and study Japanese. And I traveled to Jordan. And so these were black teachers at a K through 12 black school who wrote me recommendation letters, who supported me. So I come out of that and I'm always thankful for that. 
So what I'm saying is um, it is about opportunity. I didn't have the kind of career I wanted in college in terms of playing football. And, and I felt like a lot of aspects of my identity weren't really nurtured like they were at the high school level. It was predominantly white university at this time. But nevertheless, you know, I'm thankful for what I did have because you know, I had enough, I had so many skills and so much preparation that I could have gone in, in multiple ways. It's ideal if one can be all that they can be, you know, in terms of thriving athletically, thriving academically, you know, but nevertheless, um, at that point, maybe the creator took me to a place, you know, I would say God took me there, led me there. And because I needed to be a part of helping to raise the consciousness of some of our people in predominantly white spaces too. And so I kind of think of my work like that in a lot of ways. Let me just give you an example. I know there's some beauty around the power and the majesty of historically black colleges and universities come out of black churches, you know, and they come out of that. And so that's the beauty of them. But I always say to people, you know, the work that I do, Rev, in terms of everything, I always say to people, you know, Yes, we want black people to go into those spaces at the higher education level, but approximately only about 200,000 black students are going to be going to HBCUs every year. You know, most black children are going to predominantly white universities. And sure. in terms of a K through 12 experience, most black children go to predominantly, well, about 30% go to schools that are almost 90% black. So we have 2 million, let me repeat this again, 2 million black children in public schools in the United States that go to schools that are predominantly black. 2 million. So I would say 10 times the number of black students at HBCUs go, through, go to public schools that are predominantly black. My argument or my mission, I feel, is to say, let's focus on preparing those black children at the most sensitive and developmentally appropriate stages of their lives around identity and cultural affirmation and skills development. Let's give it to them when they're babies until they're 18 before they go to college, rather than feeling like we got to intervene and send them to a predominantly black institution when they're 18 years of age. Mm -hmm. Their minds get shaped between five and 18. Those are the most critical stages of development. So I'm saying this Black Lives Matter and the whole focus on Black institutions preparing Black people, don't forget that most Black children, or well, not most, 30% or more, 2 million go to schools that are all Black from kindergarten through 12th grade. I know I made that point a thousand times to you. No, 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 no. That's a good point. That's a good point to make because in this, and again, again, this is fabulous, man, because we're going we're gonna to turn this to the lessons that we get from this in a second. But we, but when you say that, when we have 2 million students that are that are matriculating primarily in black K through 12 schools. Exactly. The difference, when we talk about pre-integration or the early mm -hmm. days of desegregation where you had places like here in Nashville, Cameron High, you had North High, you had Pearl High, you had these places where, Washington, you had these places where many of the people who emerged into the civil rights arena, I'm sure Phillips High and in, in, uh, in Carver High, we talk mm -hmm. about places like that in Alabama and across the, the country in the 50s and the 60s, coming out of the 40s in segregated schools, you had this concept of excellence that was there because you had faculty in alignment, living in a community with people. We talk exactly. about what the differences are. Integration brought about the spread of people to different communities. Now people don't live in the same communities. And even though you find yourself in predominantly black environment, I would just ask you because you just won a million dollar Lyle Spencer uh, Foundation grant. So you should be uh, brilliant enough as I know you are to be able to uh, tell me this or guesstimate in the current environment of those 2 million kids who are in overwhelmingly black schools mm -hmm. in urban environments, what's the faculty makeup? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. I would say, yeah, a lot of them are significantly being taught by white teachers, although they're in these predominantly black spaces in terms of student population. Now, it's not like, and, but 
a lot of our people, even in university level, get taught by white or non-black people too. That's a different conversation. But you're right, the dissipation or the decimation or the um, dispersal of black intellectual capital. That is what it happens. Good. The dispersal of black intellectual capital. And as Dr. Jacob Carruthers, you know, he talks about this as intellectual warfare because we have to think like that. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, so what my work is done doing, so you mentioned about the grant, you know, it's a, that research award by the Lyle Spencer Foundation out of Chicago is about creating transformative education. So how do I create or think about this research in a way that is impactful? You know, it's not just about theory. So my work, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it, is around this whole notion of um, how do we um, recreate communally funded schools, communally, C-O-M-M-U-N-A-L-L-Y, communally funded schools. And that work, my work builds on that tradition of what we had before desegregation. So now a lot of schools in the South still got black teachers, though, Jeff. That's a different, a little different conversation. I mean, there are a lot of black teachers in Birmingham. You, in Birmingham, you probably gonna get mostly black teachers. Yeah, you know, there are still areas that are highly predominantly black or white folks like to say segregated. But nevertheless, you <laughs> yeah. still have those. So how do we the question though is how do we prepare this new generation of educators? whether leaders or thinkers who are black in that tradition of old. Mm -hmm. And those black educators that I studied that were exemplary schools in St. Louis and Atlanta, Georgia, what I call community blended educators, they did come out of HBCU. That's where those black teachers came out of. And that was a generation that kind of faded away around the early 2000s. And so now we're seeing a new generation of black educators who are not being socialized in those spaces like that. A lot of HBCUs no longer even teach, um, have teacher education programs. You know, so that's another thing. They don't even do that like they used to. A lot of them at one point were teaching the clergy and, and preparing teachers. They don't, some of them have moved away from that. Everybody is focused on something else, but the preparation of Children or teachers is crucial, you know, because you're dealing with the preparation of the next generation. And so what I'm getting at is that there are some key components of tenants that we have to really be about. And the work that I've done in my community blended model is it really talks about how the school was second to the black church, a pillar in the black community. Mm -hmm. OK, that was another thing we saw that educators had familial relationships. They weren't just teachers. It wasn't about a partnership. They were kinfolks, but we call them other mothers. The third <laughs> is that there was this affirmation of black children and their culture and their identity. And so they called you by your nickname. My teacher in our school called my brother like, Jerome, where's Big Meaty at? Knowing that was a neighborhood name. Big so Meaty. <laughs> you know, that was my brother, Michael. His name was Big Meaty. You know, and so everybody in Central City knows what I'm saying when I say big meat. You know, yeah. or or steel, steel is my other brother, um, um, Ronald. But nevertheless, they also understood that um, the there was an intergenerational. So not only did the black teachers teach the children, they taught the parents of the children, and so that's the fourth component. So there's intergenerational. You know, wow. one of the things is that, and even the principals were academic leaders who bridged the school with the community. So they weren't, I always say, when you look at the old black school model, it's just like a black church. The principal would be in the school for 35 years. You know, you can't get a black principal. You can't get a black preacher out of this church, right? You can't tell them, Doc, preach, why don't you go ahead and retire? It was the same kind of leadership model that was in the black school. And so what I'm saying is that this becomes, this is not a new model, Jeff. This is, I'm building on some of the work. Let me show you some of the people work I build on, man. I, I always say this man, Dr. James Anderson, he talks about this work in the education of blacks in the town. My work is, it pours into that history. And then I look at the work by um, great scholar Michelle Foster wrote this book, 
black teachers on teaching. Mm -hmm. And she brings that. Then we have Vanessa Silla Walker, who gives us a sense of the schooling model that was there during that time. And so what I'm saying, and then at the same time, the intellectual piece, we bring people like Du Bois, who talked I'm about- make you full screen a sec so we can see this. How education should be centered. Yeah. Can, you, can everybody see this? Yeah, we're, no, we're gonna make it full. We're gonna click our expand, make you- How education should see be that. centering. How education should be centering people. And nevertheless, you know we have Dr. Carter D. Woodson in terms of the miseducation of, of the Negro. So what I'm saying, and then my research is sociological and anthropological, and I build on that history, and I take those elements, and I, I, I synthesize that historical grounding with my own contemporary sociological research and of schools that were exemplary in the 2000s. I'm not talking about 1930, 1940. I'm talking about now. And I've written this book, Trouble in the Waters, Fulfilling the Promise of Quality Public Schooling for Black Children. And so my horrible. work is part of that tradition. It's, it's builds on that. And so what I'm saying is, this is nothing new around community funded schooling. What I'm trying to do is engage in what we call Sankofa. I'm going back to get that which was forgotten. And and I'm bringing that into the work that I do. Doc, this is yes, uh, this is good stuff, man. Look, I, I'm going to turn this in a minute to to where we need to get it. Uh, I do want to pause and say that as the time is going on, I want to open the floor for those of you who are at home. You know, if if speaks is not just about if speaks is a conversation. So mm -hmm. if you're at home and you have a question or comment to add in. Please ask a question. We got an amazing expert here today. We got lots of knowledge that can be extrapolated here. So please, we want to make sure if you got something, put it in quickly uh, because it takes us about 10 to 20 seconds for us to be able to catch that. Okay. That gives us a question. Uh, black children go to schools with black teachers, but aren't the teachers required to follow the curriculum provided by the white management staff? So how do we reconcile those energies when that happens? Well, that's always that's a great that's, question. Yeah, that's a great question. It comes out of more of the accountability movement and in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, around like No Child Left Behind, like giving people prescribed curriculum. But one of the things um, I always say to people, you know, they, they ask me questions like, well, what about these, how, these educational reforms and policies and curricula that teachers have to implement? I always say to them, you know, the real curriculum is really what the teacher does. So we can have all these grand ideas about educational policy, but when a teacher goes into that classroom, it's really kind of what they teach. And so one can teach, for example, about certain things. You can teach about um, anything in history. You know, for example, the American Revolution, what people say, well, we have to teach the American Revolution, that's white. No, you don't have to teach the American Revolution from a white perspective. You can teach the American Revolution from a revolutionary perspective and connect it with other revolutions around the world. You can connect it with the Haitian Revolution. You can also look at it and say that the black people weren't fighting a revolution for the colonists against the British, but they were fighting for freedom. This guy, Gary B. Nash, wrote a book called The Forgotten Fifth, in which he talks about that black people were fighting for freedom on both sides of the Atlantic. They weren't fighting for the colonists. They weren't fighting for the British. They were fighting for themselves. So you can take a career, but here's the thing. A, an educator, if you give me, you can give me any curriculum by any oppressor. And I'm going to flip it. I'm going to, I can cover what they say, but I'm going to teach it from the vantage point of those at the bottom. It's a different, mm. but that, that requires the teacher to be liberated and her or his thinking. Okay. It's not about a curriculum being given to you. And, and you know what? That's interesting though, because it brings to bear uh, the, the reason why we're here today, the conversation yes, that we're here with, because you're talking about the education, the enlightenment and the perspective of the teacher. The mm -hmm. dates stay the same. The context is different. So right. whether you're talking about 
uh, Christmas addicts getting shot or the, or the Boston massacre, or you're talking about the exactly. Boston Tea Party, whatever it is, the dates are locked in stone, but the context is different. So for someone who is there, who is watching the celebration of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, if they are there, there's always the joke about look on the dollar bill, you see the <laughs> you look real close, there's a little black guy, in the, you know, there's all of that. All yeah. of the deep people, we go into those deep holes of, you know, they put the brother on the bill to signify, you know, that there was an African presence there. That's fine too. But we say that the perspective of the person who is in a state of involuntary servitude right. is going to be different from the perspective of the person who is signing a document that says all men are created equal and are endowed with inalienable, all of the beautiful language, but they are yet slave owners who do not see the people who are on the outside serving them that they own technically in a space of, of, of involuntary servitude as human beings. So right. the, the same document signing takes place, but we have a radically different perspective. So history can be taught by dates, but there also has to be that added perspective that Dr. Clark talks about, adding that element of what are the missing pages from that. That adds to everyone's humanity. So even right. when we're talking about the, the color of the teacher mattering less than the, uh, the cultural awareness of the teacher, now, we do know right. that the children do better in environments where the teachers look like them. It's just a, it's a natural space of nurturing, but we also right. know that there are people who will be with our children who may look like our children, who may not care anything about our children's growth and development. Yeah. And that can be equally as dangerous as someone who doesn't look like them, who has decided in the back of their mind they are inferior because they right. have not taken the time to study history and understand our place in it contextually. Right, right. I think the key thing that we have to think about in terms of education, though, is that if there are teachers, anybody teaching children, is here's the thing I think about. Do they, did they affirmatively make a decision to go into the profession to work with black children? That is important. If somebody says, I want to be a teacher because I wanted to educate black children, that's a very strong political statement. And those are the people that I'm looking for to teach black children. Hmm. And you understand, and it, it transcends race in the sense that there is a lot, there's some research. This is more like a, I'm giving you all a snapshot. People say, well, can um, I know black teachers who weren't good for black children? I say, yeah, you got those too. And I can show you a whole bunch of white teachers too, though. Okay. The point of it is there's a race and social class element to it, Jeff. What I mean is that the race and social class element is that black teachers, there's some research that black teachers who come from, um, very low income and working class environments are some of the best teachers for poor black children, better than middle class black teachers. Okay. Mm. There's, it also says that upper class white teachers who made deliberate decisions, intentional decisions going to teaching are also some of the good teachers for black children. You follow that? that. How about yeah. that? So, yes, I see it. I see the, it. The groups that they argue that this research suggests that you that can be problematic for poor black children are white people who come from low income backgrounds and white people who come from affluent backgrounds. How about that? So How about it's that? very complicated, but yeah. over, overarching overall, the research does show that. Students do better, no matter white or black, with teachers of same race. Mm -hmm. The research says that scientifically we know that. The question is, can can we as a society accept that? You yes, know, and, so yes, and be okay with that, and be, and be okay, okay with that. Is that and but not, not see it as a challenge? Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about this spiritual space is we're very intentional about beloved community. So mm -hmm. we're very intentional about, regardless of what your race, class, skin color, ethnicity, gender, orientation, this is a home right. for you where you are seen as a spirit navigating the human experience. So when you come into this space, there's a certain understanding that you are going to learn something new. Right. So when we have, we have 
a black and Asian and Latino people who come here, they understand that this is a, the energy of African spirituality, the energy of Eastern spirituality, the energy of non-Western spirituality is very present in the space. So by intentionally being a part of that, you're saying I'm open to learning, I'm open to growth, I'm open to tapping into that space. To me, that gives you a superpower over somebody right. else who would stay insulated and say, you know what, I'm not going to go into that space unless there's nine of us and then one token person of color. <laughs> we could say that it's diverse because there are plenty of places like that. We're not right. the only places who are doing law of attraction energy and all of that, but we go into other spaces. I used to go to spaces like that where it was, mm -hmm. it was eight white people, one black person, and then one person that was Latino. And the conversation was, oh, we're so diverse. Right. But it's uncomfortable being a minority. But I say, if you can be uncomfortable being in a minority space, as we use this term contextually, right. then you gain a superpower and an edge in reintroducing yourself to the family of humanity. And that's mm -hmm. the beautiful space that you walk in. I got a couple of quick questions that are coming up in the space, uh, Doc. And then okay. we're going to wrap it, man, because again, this could, this could be a full out conference and one day it will be, one day okay. it shall be because that's what this space is for. That's what we're gonna be doing. So Dr. Morris, you got from uh, Michelle Mayberry says, uh, Dr. Morris, why did you and your wife decide to homeschool? How was it beneficial? And how can parents that work multiple jobs homeschool their children today? Okay, well, so that's, question, a, it? that's, yeah. that's like three questions. The first, yeah. why did we? Let me say this. Um, the first thing is that my wife, Mary Mew, made the executive decision to homeschool, home, not homeschool, home educate our children. Okay. Mm. So Mary was at the forefront of this in terms of home educating. At first, I was like, you know, thinking about like how do we work with the school where our children would be zoned to and be greatly engaged there because that's what my research was about. You know, how do we become engaged with predominantly black schools in the interest of our children? You know, so, and, and also being a benefit to everybody else's children. But Mary, um, it depends on one's experiences. So Mary um, had an experience in which the, the institution of schooling for black children in West Tennessee. She's from a little town called Henderson, Tennessee. And one of the things is that they were, they have been subject to the um, the integration. Her parents had gone to a black school, but then the rural black school was closed and all the black children were forced into the predominantly white schools. And Mary was in that generation, you know, taught by white people, white teachers. And they hated black children. They didn't like the black people in the neighborhood. So why would you expect the people to hate, to love the children? Like Malcolm said, only a fool would let his enemy teach his children. Mm -hmm. And people don't think about that, but we have to be common sense people. Now in Atlanta, Georgia, where we live, there were black teachers there, I would say that. But Mary also was like, hey, this this, this was not for our children. So, so that was the genesis of this whole thing that educate our children. Um, in terms of the question around how can a parent work multiple jobs? Yeah. That is the only way I can say is that you got to get somebody in your family or some community people to assist in that effort if there's not a partner right. in the household. Because it's going to be very problematic, very challenging to do that because it's going to require so one of the things about home education is not that you give a child information. Home education is a um, is a family affair in the sense that when you're teaching your children, you are also learning. So, for example, hmm. if you say, well, let's talk about that's a great point. If you are learning, like, let's, let's learn about the revolution. And so you might be learning, oh, you learn about the revolution, but then you find some information about the Haitian revolution, then you get a sense, okay, this is what the Haitians were doing here. And so my point is that you are, homeschooling is not about the child learning, it's about the family learning, the family learning. And so I've learned, let me tell you, I took 
I took some stuff while I've truly been going through the home education model. I've learned, I've gotten two or three more educations, you know, and so I've learned with our children. So that's the beauty of it. So I want parents to think that you're not, it's not about what that child is learning. It's like, a, what are you in that household learning? While, so it, in that way, it becomes a, something that the child would appreciate everybody learning together. Oh, that's awesome, man. Okay, look, at a note, and I'll get a couple of more questions in. I know I'm lonely. Uh, Wisconsin has some things. Man, this, again, this is great <laughs> stuff. And I'm committing you to an Infinity Fellowship uh, homeschooling seminar okay that we're going to do and you and you and mary are going to do it through infinity fellowship we're going to do that and we're going to get some practical tools together we're going to schedule that in the next month or so uh and i'm just going to go ahead and commit you to that and we'll set up the structure because people really people really need this from an experiential space right where there's fruit to show you know i always say that a proven practice outweighs a brilliant theory so okay. I want to make sure that we're we're in a space where we're dealing with people who have practiced this and and seen good results. But we got a question coming in in terms of education. Okay. Melina, you you sense it, of course. Maybe it was the bio, but this this expertise in education, an opinion or your thoughts. Uh, Felina mm -hmm. wants to know what are your thoughts on alternative education methods such as Waldorf or Montessori. Um, I'll give you the well, full screen for that. One of the things I'll say is that. Um, my wife, again, Mary, I'm going to give her some shout outs here. Mary studied, Mary's in public health, and she studied emphatically around the Montessori model. And so Mary was clear that the Montessori model would be best. Um, maybe she has some ancestors giving her some intuition, but the Montessori model is Maria Montessori. She's an Italian physician, and she was working with children who were, um, deemed retarded or slow learners during that time. But she was able to get these children to thrive by centering the education in their experiences, like making sure everything was excellent, like small for them in terms of like utensils, making sure everything was appropriate. And so Maria Montessori, Dr. Montessori was able to get these children to thrive when others thought they couldn't achieve. And so the Montessori method starts where the child is interested in. So if a child is interested in saying, well, I just want to make some cookies, mom or dad, you do that. You work with the child on that. You teach mathematics using that. And you kind of keep it at that level until the child t lets you know what he or she wants to do. What if the child says, I like video games? You don't shun it. You say, okay, let's go into this here. Let's, how do we learn this? What is this about? How do you learn how to program? So the, I'm really, a um, fan of the, the Montessori method because I see the Montessori method in some ways kind of closer to an African Senate method in the sense that you start with the individual or the person and you let their interests guide you as the teacher. You don't impose. It's not like I'm pouring like a, a jug into a mug. I'm pouring knowledge into you. You allow um, it, it's educari which um, you bring out of the person knowledge because yes. they already have a beginning just like spirituality you know that we're not looking for a god or a creator somewhere else it's within and yes. that's what african center is and that's what money story is. so i, I kind of i resonate more with the money story method because we allow that to be the model that to shape what our children are doing and um we, we allow their interests to guide us throughout this whole process and we we continue to talk with them they're at yeah, some of the top universities in the world, but we also, we're staying on as parents because we continue to teach them because we're not going to allow that institution, no matter where they go, to be the primary teachers of them. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah. So here, I've got a couple of quick comments, man. It's, it's yes, Y'all, such a great conversation today. Tag people beyond this, send this link to people and just tell them they got to be a part of today's service because we're, there's so many things that have come out of this wonderful conversation. And I appreciate your, your patience with us, Doc, okay. uh, and being with us on here. I've got two things, Rosetta, and I think I'm going to put this up on the screen if we can. Okay. Uh, Sister Rosetta, who works with the Comedic Institute in Chicago, she's got a great comment. Uh, black teachers have to know their history so they can then be taught how to incorporate the missing pages of African history into the curriculum and still fulfill the standards mandated by the school boards. 
The Kinetic right. Institute of Chicago, she's with, you mentioned Dr. Jacob Carruthers, had mm -hmm. the Teaching About Africa program designed mm -hmm. to help teachers do this. So look up the Kinetic Institute in Chicago, right. the Teaching About Africa program, a long history, uh, along with ASCAC and other organizations of creating curriculums that walk and coincide. And Sister Rosetta, right. if you've got a link that you can put in the comments, uh, please put that link in the comments so we can get that going. Sister Denise had a comment a little earlier uh, about, uh, she has four children ages 29 to 12 and noticed in some cases it's hard to tell teachers from the kids, uh, the way they talk, dress, and the mannerisms. Uh, so if there's no teacher-student relationship created out of respect, along with the other distractions in a classroom, how does a child get on track to reach their potential? How does a child get- How does so, a child get on, get on track, stay on track to reach their potential if there's not a respect level? In other words, if they feel that the teacher's one of their peers, a lot of that right. happens. Well, exactly. one of the things- notice that. Okay, I follow what you're saying. So one of the things that um, I think we have to think about as black people, it's kind of like, what do we want in this system or this structure? And what do we, what if, what about the, the things from the old, from the past that we need to be bringing into this? And that is, um, it's really about the issue of respect. It's not shunning people's um, creativity or sense of assertiveness or independence. We don't, we don't want to like shun that or stifle that in a child. But there is a sense of respect too. I'm reminded of when I went to school, when, this is in Birmingham, all of us, you know, you know, the teachers, they were dressed. You see how, how, how I'm dressed like this? I'm like this with all of my classes. But my colleagues who are professors, sometimes they go to class with jeans on and stuff, you know. Sure. And that's not the model, black folk. You know, if you wear African clothes, at least, you know, you, you can wear, I'm not saying you have to wear Western clothes. Be sharp. Sure. Look good, and when you look good, and then demand respect. I'm always honored when I think about my teacher, Miss Gary, in sixth grade. You know, when we lined up and walked in the classroom, and you know, the baddest of the bad always were were in check in her classroom. And so, part of it is about how do you carry yourself, and how do you treat yourself, and what are the traditions? Do you do you do you pull from those? traditions that those black teachers had in those black schools. Are you in that tradition? And if we don't have it, how do we reteach that? So yes, go into the school and begin with um, a moment of silence or or know that you're going to refer to this person as doctor this or professor that or miss this or miss that. There's got to be that respect that is there. But the respect has to start from within though too. You know, and, and it comes with experience. So, you know, it's challenging for young people to go in and teach. So I would say more of that right there. A little bit I want to say about Kinetic Institute, you referenced that. There are some, um, I know Dr. Carol Lee, she was the president of the American Educational Research Association. And she's also, her other name, her, her, her real name is Safisha Madibuti. Madibuti, that's Dr. Um, Haki, Haki's wife. Yeah. Yeah. Safisha is her name. And so... So I know she's been doing some leadership around there, some work. Um, again, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, I'm very familiar with that work and I bring that into what I do. I don't always show up at all the events or things that they do, but that I consider that body of work as part of my, men something that mentored me along the way. And I know even your brother has been instrumental in developing curricula around centering people. So yes, definitely. Yeah, and additionally, the uh, Freedom Schools, I think Greg Freedom wrote the school, yeah. original curriculum for Freedom Schools out of Philadelphia. So it's just a right. really tight-knit circle here of people putting good in the world. Brother Roosevelt yeah. Luster wanted to know if you're familiar with or what are your thoughts on content on uh, Khan Academy, K-H-A-N? Are you familiar? Yes, yes. I, uh, yeah, one of the things that um, the Khan Academy content, let me tell you, I'm not endorsing it, but I will say to people, that if you use that content, especially for parents whose children who have been thrust into home schooling now during the pandemic, that I know you have teachers who are teaching your children in school and they're giving you this information, but 
my children go to Stanford and Washington University, and they still use Khan Academy if they don't get some information. Because you can always go back and rewind it. You know, so Khan Academy has been very important in terms of some aspect of democratizing learning. Mm -hmm. So making it accessible the way before we were thrust into this. And so however people feel about it in terms of like getting content, like you want to learn statistics, calculus, you can learn it with Khan Academy. But parents, let me say to you too, don't just sit your child down and say, learn this stuff. You sit down and learn with the child and see how challenging this stuff is. Because if you're struggling with it, then what do you think going through their head? So we have to do that. That's good, man. That's yeah. good, Jerome. Doc, okay. look, man, we, yes, we had us a good conversation today. Uh, we're going to continue to have more yes, of these great conversations great. today. Uh, we have uh, we have covered so much of, mm -hmm. of value to so many people today. And I appreciate you on behalf of Infinity. We see you. You're welcome. Uh, and we see your work. We see your journey, your story. Yes, sir. We see the contributions that you put into the world and continue to put into the world. Uh, we see your wide range of expertise. Uh, mm -hmm. I could ask you who's going to win the uh, who's going to win the East and the West in, uh, in the coming NBA playoffs. Yeah. You'll probably be spot on on that too, because right. you you you're well rounded like that. But I wanted I wanted to give you one last kind of wrap up. Yes, uh, and I'll full screen you on this one for this, and I ask you spiritually speaking, what can we what can all humanity take away from the study and celebration of black history? Um, I think the most important thing is to understand that um, we all, all of us are African people. Mm -hmm. All of us have, we, we left the continent at different times. Some by choice, those of us who are in the Western hemisphere, whether Brazil, Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, Haiti, the Dominican Republic or the United States by force, you know? And so whether we went to Asia or went to Europe, we're African people. And that's the, that's the essence of what this is about. And so we have all kind of genetic and genealogical and historical information that is confirming what people like Sheikh and a lot of folk, folks call him Diop, you know, yeah. Is already talked about. Got a B op in the hood. Yeah, yeah, black woman think D op. Shake that's a joke. Has already written about and talked about that we are all from that region. And there is no polygenetic theory around humans. That we emerge, that there's a monogenetic theory, that we come from one. And so, and but there's not a sense of claiming superiority or inferiority. It's just we know that those of us who have what we call African features still, that we have a greater genetic diversity. And that diversity has been a blessing and not a curse. And that um, the, the genetic diversity and the creator, the ancestors have created us in such a way that what we see in terms of human um, diversity is really an adaptation to environment, physical landscape, and genetic mutations along the way to ensure that we as a species will survive. That's really what it's about. And what we have done, unfortunately, there have been systems and ideologies out of fear. And I like to think about Dolomite on this one here. You know, when he talked about white folks' insecurity, that's really what he is talking about. That this sense of insecurity has compelled a group of folks to feel like they should be dominant. But we know the truth. And so I'm glad that you are part of rectifying that and recentering and correcting and offering counter narrative to what has been pervasive. And we're going to get this thing right up, you know, instead of upside down. We're about to flip it back to what it's about. And so I see myself and as part of a continuation of a group of people as part of that lineage of trying to do that by modeling it, and not just in um, theory and saying what should happen, but as also, they say, you should judge the tree by the fruit that it bears, too. And so I want to make sure that the fruit that I'm producing is um, personifying 
the theories that I say I purport to embrace. Dr. Jerome Morris, yes, brothers and sisters, the E. Des Lee Endowed Professor of Urban <laughs> Education, University of Missouri, St. Louis. Check out his book, Troubling the Waters. Uh, and I've got a second book. On yeah. City, and, and the second one coming out, Central City Blues. Is that yes, forthcoming? Sir. What's the third book? Because I know this the third yeah, book. It's going to be one called um, Mirage in the New Black Mecca. It's about, based on some research I've done in Atlanta, Georgia. But maybe about three or four years from now. But let me get this second one out. Inshallah, God's will next year. Love it. Love it. Dr. Jerome Morris is on Twitter, y'all. Blow his Twitter page up. Follow him. Be with him. And look for him again. We're looking for you again in the next few weeks, Brother Jerome. You and Mary, and Mary uh, tell him I to come out, the entire family. We love you guys, man. And we, we love appreciate you. you. Uh, this will be up so you can share with all your friends so they can, they can see a path forward and how to yes, put sir. this contextually together. We appreciate yes, thank you. you. Thank you for this forum. Appreciate it, brother. All right. All right. Now I stay. All right. Great. Y'all, what, what an awesome day it has been at Infinity. I want to speak that there is a covering over your life, that something that was said today in today's conversation has moved you to think. Uh, it's made you comfortable with the spirit that has always guided you into alignment. It's made you uncomfortable in spaces that you may not have thought about or known about or experienced, and that has nudged you toward alignment either way. We know and accept that in this moment, uh, we have experienced another good thing. To Dr. Jerome Morris, to our conversation on restructuring, reconnecting humanity, you all, we love you. There's not anything you can do about it either. So we invite you to watch this replay, to share this service today through the week. We love it when we see so many replays through the week and so many people being involved in the comments even during the week. People comment uh, during the replays and that's a beautiful thing. So when Dr. Jerome looks on and people look and they see all of the accolades coming in and the affirmations coming in on the chat box, it means the entire world to us. So take a deep breath in with me. Exhale to release. Allow your eyes to close for a second. As we tap into this space here, we give thanks. We give thanks to you, Divine Source, for the conversation that was held today with Dr. Jerome Morris. We give thanks for the opportunity that we have been given to celebrate black history as a part of the larger world history. We thank you for the opportunity to reinsert these pages in the book. We thank you for the opportunity to educate people of all backgrounds, to bring them together again in this space on Sunday for this divine ritual that is based on and in love. We thank you for the safety that we are proclaiming over the many people who are listening to this stream or this replay. We speak alignment with divine purpose because this is the year of alignment. Thank you for the voices that were here today. Thank you for the energy that is flowing through Sister Kanitha right now that is radiating through her body and through her mind, that is covering her in divine light. Thank you for her being here in this space with us today. We speak a blessing over Sister Alicia who made her way to this space today and managed the technology so beautifully that everybody had an opportunity to be a part. We speak remembered lines. We speak powerful nuances this week as she moves her energy into the movie world filmmaking and, and we speak that she lights up the screen and inspires and touches millions of people when she appears on them in a few months. We speak that those of you who had contributed today to the conversation had an answer that filled your soul to those of you who affirmed this space, to those who gave and are giving in this space. Thank you for the excitement creator, for this wonderful community and this wonderful opportunity of love vibration Thank you for the ability to always remember that we are the high energy and not the low energy, that we don't operate from a place of lack, but we operate from a space of abundance, abundance in health, abundance in healed relationships, abundance in walking in divine purpose, abundance in being in alignment. 
and being okay with the skin we're in, no matter what the shade is. All of these things we give thanks for in abundance. We proclaim them as truth and we walk as such boldly, proudly. Oh, we just thank you for these things and other things we can't put into words. We raise our hands in an affirmation. We flex our muscles and give the high five to the God inside of us because we know that we can do all things with you. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Hotep. Shalom. Namaste. Ashe. As our hearts and minds are clear, we'll let y'all hum along with us for our end song. We invite you to follow us online. We're amplifying our online space. We've got a slide that you can see how to follow us online, y'all. If you just discovered the Infinity Fellowship today, congratulations and welcome home. YouTube.com backslash Infinity Fellowship. Facebook.com backslash Infinity Fellowship. Instagram at the Infinity Fellowship. And you can follow me online at the Rev Jock. That's at the Rev Jock on Instagram and on Twitter. So delighted that so many of you have, have helped me amplify social media presence. I, I've never been a person who gets online and says, follow me and let me follow these. No, I, I put some stuff out there and the vibration connects. So I appreciate you all. Hopefully there's something in there that we share that reminds you that we're here to look out for you. That's what the Infinity Fellowship is about. If you want to go a short distance, go by yourself. If you want to go a long distance, go with many others. This is the space where you're going long distance. We're proud and happy to be your spiritual community. And we're unapologetic about looking you in your eye and telling you that you're absolutely awesome, that you're absolutely beautiful, that you're absolutely powerful. Why? It's the God in you. And so as you open your hands to receive or place your hands over your heart to receive this benediction energy, as we recognize that we'll see you again next week, we speak that the love of God, the wisdom of the ancestors, and the infinite and abundant power of the universe rest, rule, rock, and abide with you. Henceforth, now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hotep. Shalom. Namaste. Ashe. We'll see you next week for Yoga Sunday. Join me on the mat. Don't leave your physical out of it. It's a part of it, too. We got to align that mind, body, and spirit. Till I talk to you again, this has been Rev Jeff reminding you that when you do get information and take it in, it becomes knowledge. When you take knowledge and put it into practice, oh, it becomes wisdom. Y'all be wise. We love you. Nothing you can do about it either. Peace and blessings. <laughs>